All right. Well, um, thank you all um, for joining today. My name is Justin Rowling. I'm the Vice President of National Sales for Formal Force. And um, thank you all for our reoccurring attendees. We appreciate you showing up um, on a monthly basis to see these webinars. And for everyone that's new, uh, thank you for joining. Um, Anthony Velasquez is our Chief Product Officer. He'll, he'll introduce himself um, shortly, but he'll go through uh, our topic for the month. And then in the end, we will open it up for, um, for Q&A. If you have questions during the um, presentation, please just add them to the chat box. And uh, we'll address those after um, the meeting is over. Um, once again, we, are, um, we do this monthly. And so look for the emails coming out from the marketing team and, and sign up. And we do appreciate you all attending on a monthly basis. And I'll pass it over to Anthony Velasquez. Thank you, Justin. Um, I appreciate that intro. Uh, I want to echo what Justin said, because that's really important uh, for those of you that have uh, uh, come to other webinars and you're joining us again. Thank you so much. Uh, funny story. I met a lot of you at the recent 340B conference and I was uh, I was called the webinar guy. Um, so I just want to let you all know I will accept that title um, and I'll probably get a shirt that says the webinar guy eventually, because I think it's a pretty cool title. Um, so again, th thank you. I mean, there's a lot of you that I've uh, emailed with and uh, and met, and it seems that uh, these 30-minute uh, webinars are bringing value and hopefully helping you uh, learn a little bit more about what's going on in the 340B space, which is our goal, is to educate and also to share good strategies, good operational things that you can put into place. We really try to be uh, less about policy and more about strategy, operationalizing, things that you can practically do to improve your 340B program, um, especially in the day and age that we are uh, with manufacturer restrictions. I don't know about you, but I've been in 340B for over a decade, and I, uh, I would love to go back to the days where we were uh, discussing uh, missing a sweet number, uh, for a pharmacy on your OPA database. Like those were the good old days where we were, we were talking about, you know, database, um, uh, entry errors. And, uh, unfortunately we are not there today. And, uh, uh, you know, these days in 340B, there's a lot of manufacturer restrictions that are, um, causing covered entities to lose in some cases, millions and millions of dollars, which is unfortunate because that impacts patient care and many other things. So, uh, I'm really excited about today's webinar. Um, we are going to talk about some hidden opportunities that you may not be taking advantage of, of at the moment. I do want to start off by saying this, nothing that I share in this presentation should be co constituted as legal advice. Um, my background is in working in 340B for over a decade, half of my time on the covered entity side, half of my time on the TPA side. So I feel like I have a wide breadth of experience in, in both of those worlds. Uh, however, these things are complicated. 340B is not black and white. Um, and there's a lot of things that um, it's probably best to uh, have your legal team, your compliance team on board before you attempt to implement or execute on. Um, so the agenda for today, um, as you know, we like to keep it short, straight to the point, make sure you get a lot of value. We're going to talk about submitting to ESP and, um, the new wave of manufacturer restrictions that just, that were just announced. I'm not going to go into details on that because a lot of this content and the webinar announcement kind of went out before a lot of those things sort of came in a, in a big wave. So we prepare ahead for this. Um, the next webinar, I will be talking about that, but for today, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about that briefly, but then I'm going to talk about submitting to ESP, um, your patient definition policy, uh, maximizing data interfaces, entity owned pharmacy, and why that should be a strategy that you're considering, uh, in the long term. And I also want to talk about referral capture programs. So these are all, uh, hidden opportunities, ways that we think that, uh, things that we think covered any should have on their radar implemented, if not, maybe should be at the top of your list to further look into. All right. So as, as you all know, uh, as some of you might know, this is fresh of fresh off the press. This just came out. A lot of this information is it's pretty new. Um, uh, I would say in probably the last few weeks, um, there are five new restriction updates. Please note that I mentioned updates because all of the manufacturers that have come out and announced new restrictions 
had all had a policy in the past, had all had a what we called a policy one, and now there's a there's a new updated restriction that we're calling policy two. Um, as you can see, a lot of these do not have a tremendous amount of heads up. Um, the Amgen restriction, for example, went into effect 4-11-2023, so just a few days ago. The Abby restriction is coming up on 4-17-2023. The Pfizer restriction will be on May the 1st, and the GSK, and the Novartis. Um, some of these have massive complications um, uh, applications to which covered entities they impact. Um, the NDC list got larger. Um, so there, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and I will be doing that in the next webinar, as I mentioned, um, because a lot of this content was prepared ahead of time. Uh, but I do want to, I did want to highlight this. Um, if you are uh, not aware of these, if you don't have the letters, some of these are posted on LinkedIn. You can ask your TPA, ask your account manager, your uh, primary contact should have gotten that letter from the manufacturer. So you want, you might want to check there. Um, and then I'll move on to share just a little bit of on the legal side and policy side. Um, there are two other cases that are pending decisions related to the manufacturer exclusions um, with with uh, manufacturers. Um, I think I think we're still waiting on that. We're still waiting for a decision on that that hopefully could turn the tide is what we're hoping for, at least give us on the on the entity side some uh, momentum uh, in the right direction. Um, there were two there were two updates from uh, uh, a Senate per perspective or a more con Congress perspective of, of 340B, a Protect 340B Act, uh, the Protect 340B Act of 2023. Looks like it was it reintroduced. It uh, it is more uh, covering discriminatory rates against covered entities from PBM and insurers. It's not addressing the manufacturer uh, restriction piece. Um, and then additionally, on 411, it was announced that um, the Senate Help Committee is leaving 340B out of a bipartisan drug policy bill that they are attempting to pass. Um, so 340B uh, being removed from that uh, it might be unfortunate, uh, depending on what, what language was considered, uh, but it doesn't look like there's going to be much movement um, as of this moment at a... At a at a Senate level or congressional level to help covered entities uh, with some of these manufacturer restrictions. All right, with that said, so now let's jump into uh, submitting to ESP. So ESP submission. Uh, ESP is the platform, um, if those of you that are not aware that the manufacturers are utilizing for submitting claims data in order to provide 340B pricing to covered entities. Um, now, there's new restrictions. There's updated restrictions. So what do, what do I do? Uh, number one, you want to read the fine print. There are um, all of these vary. They're not they're not uh, simple to follow. There's no again coordination. It seems. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the GSK policy, for example. Uh, applies restrictions to both entities and hospitals. Um, one of uh, the Pfizer one, it's only for one one drug. Um, the Pfizer updated policy covers um, a, a one one uh, particular item. Um, there are other policies that are um, now uh, saying you can designate a specialty pharmacy and a regular contract pharmacy. So you want to look into that. So you, you really have to read the fine print to really understand how each um, manufacturer exclusion is going to impact your cover entity. Um, most of these are still impacting the hospitals, uh, but the uh, grantees were also impacted in this sort of round of restrictions. Um, I do want to share, and one thing that um, for you to know is that immediately upon receiving these uh, updated restrictions, um, or preparing for the ones that are upcoming on April the 17th and May the 1st, you want to get together with your team and, and put together an order strategy. Maybe even this is a sort of a, 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 pro, a procedural policy that you have in place when these restrictions are announced. Um, and here's the thought behind it. If you have 
accumulations, let's say that you are a entity owned pharmacy and you don't have an auto replenishment uh, uh, turned on with your TPA, for example, and you have accumulations of these products that are now subject to a restriction in the future, you want to consider you want to consider uh, putting in place a process by which you order down those accumulations. Again, only in the context of having eligible accumulated uh, NDCs, do you want to consider doing this where um, you have your in-house pharmacy, you have, let's say, 30 packages um, accumulated of a certain drug that is going to be restricted, um, then you want to go ahead and work with your team about placing an order for those drugs, having the storage to store that product, and how you're going to utilize that product um, for uh, you know, as part of your uh, normal pharmacy operation. So that is something that I have heard a lot of our covered entities doing. That's something that I highly encourage that I think can help sort of, you know, minimize the impact. Um, this might not work for every scenario. This might not work if you have your contract pharmacies on auto replenishment, and therefore they don't have a lot of accumulations. But if you have an in-house pharmacy or you have a contract pharmacy that is um, replenishing, replenishing on demand, you might want to move these NDCs to the top of the list. Uh, I know some of the gateways were doing this. I I heard that uh, Walmart was one of the chain pharmacies that was trying to uh, do something like this and some of the others. Um, that are ordering before that pricing is removed across all of your accounts. Um, the pharmacy designation. Um, as you get these letters, um, you might not know exactly what to do. You might not want to submit to ESP. You're still in discussions. Your, your covered entity is not sure what to do. Um, I would recommend that you at least follow the process of designating a pharmacy, at least go through that process in the timeline outlined um, in the uh, letter from the manufacturer so that at least you can have that piece of it um, uh, completed before that deadline. Um, it's been our experience that if you do it afterwards, it's a little bit more difficult to get that pricing turned on. But if you do it by the deadline, not that it's perfect. I've heard CEs that have done it by the deadline and still not, not able to access pricing, but we do, uh, we do recommend that you meet those deadlines um, at least to cover your bases as you determine whether to submit or not submit. Um, so, and, and you want to follow the specific policy, as I mentioned, uh, for the in-house pharmacies, there's some differences in each policy as well. So I wouldn't assume that you're going to keep 340B pricing on your in-house entity own um, um, uh, pharmacies. I wouldn't assume that you're going to keep pricing on that and definitely follow up and make sure that that will be the case. Um, there's some distinctions in some of the policies about partially own or now not allowed. There's some, um, especially larger uh, hospitals that might have a setup where the pharmacies are owned by a sister organization under the umbrella of, of the sort of parent organization. And it seems that some of those have been excluded from receiving 340B pricing like they were in the previous policy and policy one from some of the, the manufacturers. Uh, please consider if you have multiple TPAs to know what each TPA is doing. So if your deadline is on April, on May 1st, you want to know what is, what are all my TP, those of you that have four or five TPAs, you want to know what are, what is the policy for each TPA? Are they going to automatically block on my behalf? Do they expect me to go in and block it? Do they offer the tools or the features to go in and block those, um, those uh, manufacturers uh, on my own. So you want to know what each CPA is doing because uh, each CPA is doing something a little bit different. Uh, so you definitely want to follow up on that. And you want to update your internal policy. So um, as these are coming out, one of the things that I've encouraged in the past, I believe in the last webinar, um, about having a policy that strictly lays out what your covered entity is doing as it relates to manufacturer restrictions, I think is very critical and important um, for, for your entire team to know how you guys are going to execute on this and update your process. If you have a process where um, you are submitting um, for um, your TPA number one, a certain way, TPA number two, a certain way, you want to update that process, have your SOPs in place to make sure that you're accounting for these new updated restrictions as they may apply to you. 
Um, number two, let's talk about your patient definition. This is often an area that's overlooked. Um, you might not have even looked at your patient definition um, in uh, recently, uh, in the last couple of years. I know that when I worked on the entity side, we attempted to review our entire policy once a year. Um, that's easier said than done. Things get, things get busy, things get missed. Uh, but I do want to encourage you, if you haven't reviewed your policy lately, to go ahead and do that. Um, uh, because there might be opportunities for you to expand the definition of a patient. As I mentioned, uh, 340B is not black and white. Um, and as I mentioned, nothing that I'm saying constitute as legal advice, but I do want to say, uh, from experience, I have seen instances where a covered entity might be more, I would say more on the conservative side and might say, you know, we only consider a patient, uh, if they've had a visit in the last six months. Well, maybe you want to revisit that and maybe you can push that back to 12 months if the patient has had a visit in the last year and not the last six months. Maybe you want to consider um, changing your TPA logic to expand that look back period um, a little bit as well to ensure that you're not missing out on claims that you could ultimately be capturing. Um, you can expand your patient definition by adding additional locations. So perhaps you are a health system that has multiple locations that are not 340B eligible um, because of this manufacturer restriction, maybe that project goes up goes up in the list of, of, of to-dos that we all know exist as 340B managers and coordinators for those of you that, that are in that role uh, and pharmacy directors and, and VP of, of pharmacies. Um, but maybe adding those additional locations as a way to um, you know, offset the losses related to the manufacturer restrictions is a strategy or something that you want to consider of expanding your patient definition via that route. Um, a big one that I'm seeing, uh, we're all seeing a big trend, but I'm still seeing some companies not adopting is a referral policy. I have a whole slide on this that I'm going to be discussing further in detail, but considering things like your referral origin date. So maybe you have a referral policy, but your referral origin date says we only look for a referral in the last year. We know that in practice, that patient could have been referred two years ago, three years ago. Um, and that that physician that referred that patient is not doing a referral every time that patient comes back for care. Um, just in practice, that's not how it works. Um, so you might want to consider looking at that policy and maybe expanding on that referral origin date to say if the patient has had a referral in the last 24 months or the last 36 months, we will consider that a valid uh, referral to that uh, specialty practice. Um, and then we've seen some other things uh, a little bit more creative, but definitely uh, definitely seeing that the conversations on um, entities using medication therapy management uh, consultations uh, with maybe their pharmacists meeting with a patient, um, entities considering case management visits as an eligible visit to establish care with the patient. We're also seeing some of that and, and expanding patient definition via that route. There's a, there's a big case right now um, related to patient definition that might, um, you know, that might impact that significantly. Um, so we're waiting to see what comes about uh, from that, uh, the outcome of that case. Um, now let's talk about maximize your data interface uh, interfaces. Um, as, a, as having experience on working on the covered any side and the TPA side, I've gotten to see both uh, sides of the coin. And too often, the issues are related to the data. Um, I will say nine out of 10 times, if you have an issue in your 340B program related to compliance, it's probably the data. Um, so I encourage you to review re review your raw data, um, not the data in the TPA, not the data provided by the TPA. Go to the source, which is your IT team, your electronic medical records, and review that data on a regular basis, maybe maybe do it quarterly, maybe do it twice a year um, to ensure that you're including all the eligible locations in that feed. Um, missing a critical location, a specialty location or something like that could really be costly. I talked to entities that they don't, they have low capture rates at their TPA. They don't know why. Um, so in this, in in some of the sales calls that I've been, and I'm, I'm speaking with entities, this comes up a lot of we don't know why we have a low capture rate, and it's it's almost always related to the data. 
Um, your visit types is another one, making sure this is both a compliance and an opportunity, but making sure that you're not sending things like a lab visit or sending things like a, an ultrasound or an x-ray that could be constituted as eligible, but that you're sending all of your eligible locations or your eligible visit types. Um, location mappings, again, um, going along with not just having it in your raw data correctly, but also in your TPA correctly. Um, the daily transmission, um, who hasn't been part of a, hey, the feed hasn't hasn't been going on a daily basis and we just caught it 30 days later. I mean, if you, if you worked in a 340B setting, um, that has probably happened to you. Um, but but definitely you want to keep up with that. You want to track that and and logic and file type upgrade. So if you're if we're in 2023, if you're a covered entity that is not using an e prescription file, uh, an RX order file is called in some other places. I would highly highly recommend that you revisit that um, because that could be leading to you missing out on prescriptions uh, being captured. Okay, awesome. Now, uh, the next point, it's entity-owned pharmacies. So um, is this in your short-term goals and plans? So that's a question for you as a covered entity on this webinar. Is this in your plans? Maybe you have a robust entity-owned in-house pharmacy program. Maybe you have multiple. And if you do, awesome. That's amazing. I think that that should be in the plans of all covered entities to, at a minimum, consider um, why this makes sense and why it doesn't make sense. It makes sense because it seems that the uh, entity in-house pharmacies in some cases are safer from blocks than your contract pharmacy situation. So you want to, if you have no entity in-house pharmacy, again, I think this should be at the top of your list, something that you're considering doing, um, exploring options. I'm hearing some very creative things that, uh, some folks in the space are doing like having a centralized uh, pharmacy operations to sort of minimize the cost of opening a pharmacy and things like that. So you definitely want to explore, talk to different folks in the space that provide this option to see you know, what, what best fits your covered entity. Um, this offers better operational control too. You have more control than you do in a contract pharmacy scenario uh, when you own the pharmacy and then allows you to expand capture rates at your pharmacy through adherence checkups um, and meds the beds program. If you're a hospital um, where you have someone, you have a, a staff member sort of rotating the floors for patients that are getting ready to be discharged and you're filling those prescriptions, establishing that a connection with that patient. And maybe you do mail or maybe you do a courier services where you are delivering the medications to that patient's home. These are all sort of strategies that you can implement to expand your 340B capture. Um, and, and, and ultimately, if you don't have an entity in-house pharmacy, I think this is a great opportunity for you to sort of put your, your covenant in a safer position from additional manufacturer blocks, as we have seen the trend sort of not really impacting in-house pharmacies. Unfortunately, um, you know, the contract pharmacies are being heavily, heavily targeted. Um, now, referral capture. So I'll finish with this. So referral capture, this is my last slide uh, on, on the content. Referral capture. Um, if you're not doing this, why not? Um, and this is a serious question. There are a lot of covered entities that are still very conservative and do not want to explore referral capture. Um, so I'm hoping to help overcome some of those concerns. And I think this could be really hurting covered entities, missing opportunities, um, you know, uh, as it relates to your 340B program. So what is referral capture? Now, this, this means that you have prescriptions that are being filled at your contract pharmacies, but they're not eligible because the provider that wrote that prescription is a non-entity uh, provider. Uh, so you can have a bucket of internal referrals. This is a phrase that we use. And an internal referral, what we call is, um, this stays in the health system, but it goes from a eligible provider to a non-eligible specialty clinic, for example, but it's in the same EMR. Or you could have an external, which is an external referral is from an eligible provider to a non-eligible provider um, in uh, outside of your entire health system. So 
Um, if you have compliance concerns, there are ways to implement a referral program where you can make it very tight. Um, you can you can sort of turn the knob as to how you want to implement that. Um, it doesn't have to be sort of you capture anything and everything. You can set rules and set a policy in place to say, we only feel comfortable capturing a prescription under certain conditions. Um, so that that's something that um, you know, you should consider, um, consider if your TPA provides it as a service, if your TPA provides it as a service, um, that's something that you could probably turn on pretty easily. Um, that is, that's something that, that we do and can turn on pretty easily for our customers. Um, the next one that I'm going to share, um, you know, this is, this is not something that, that I, that I should share as a, as a, a TPA or competitor, but for, um, for the better good and for covered entities that are, that have uh, the major chain pharmacies, so, such as a Walgreens, such as a CVS, you want to explore those options that you have to utilize referral service um, in for those major chains, right? That that from what I hear, that seems to be a very smooth process. There there seems to be some some good uh, some good systems out there that are able to help covered entities with that. So. So just encourage you to at least explore that, have options, talk to other um, other referral companies to know what your options are. Um, and operationalize, operationalizing this starts with having a good policy in place and making sure that your referral partner is abiding by that policy so that you are ultimately successful in increasing your capture rate, but additionally also being compliant, which is the most important thing as we aim to be in 340B. All right, with that being said, I do wanna announce uh, on Thursday, May the 18th at 1130, we're gonna have another uh, manufacturer block uh, session. This one is going to go into de details of each manufacturer block. So we're gonna go into the weeds of each letter, um, especially the newer ones, each policy what they mean, how you can implement it, what to look out for. So we're going to go into the details of that in that next webinar. So you want to sign up. You're going to see that announcement coming out soon uh, from us. Uh, with that being said, uh, Justin, I'll turn it back to you for a quick q and I know you have to drop off. So uh, we'll see if we have any questions. I can remain for uh, past noon as well. If anyone wants to jump in and ask any questions, we can unmute you and you can come on and we can have a good discussion. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today.